All right. Hello, everybody, after a short break. Sorry about yesterday's lecture. Um, I was ill the past two days, but hopefully I'm all right. Um, so don't worry, uh, you shouldn't be in danger of getting an infection. Um, hopefully you have had a chance to look at the lecture, the recorded lecture. Maybe some of you have, some of you haven't. We will be building on it a little bit today. Okay, so if you haven't, make sure you watch it sooner rather than later because a lot of the other things will be building on the previous one. Uh, as you can see, I have a slightly different recording setup, so we'll see if it, if it works. Hopefully it works well and there will be a recording from this. If it doesn't work, then I will have to change the setup. Um, today's lecture is going to be about the metabolism of neurotransmitters. So in the previous lecture, which we didn't have together, but you saw recorded, um, I spoke about the fact that in the synapse, the information between two nerve cells and an astrocyte, if we are in the central nervous system, there is an astrocyte, usually an astrocyte uh, projection a pedicle, which is close to the synapse. Uh, the signal is transmitted by means of releasing neurotransmitters from vesicles and these neurotransmitter molecules then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neurons, specific receptors, which then start some signaling cascades later on. And you've heard about quite a few signaling cascades and type, types of receptors and we will talk specifically about neurotransmitter receptors in the next lecture. So today what I want to cover is how we create neurotransmitters, how we make them in metabolic pathways uh, so that they can be packaged, so they can be transported into the vesicles and can be then uh, exocytosed using the, um, the machinery that was discussed in the previous lecture. So today is going to be a metabolic lecture. We'll be talking about metabolic pathways, some of them very short, some of them a little bit longer. And as you will see, we will be connecting to a lot of the metabolic pathways that you already know, or at least that you already covered. Okay, if you don't know them, you should. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you've done already will come helpful because a lot of the things are, you are basically have, have, have already been covered um, and there will be some additions to it and a few pathways that will be completely new. So that's the plan for today. Now. Basically, all neurotransmitters that we have in our body are derived from amino acids. So there are derivatives of amino acids. In some instances, they are just amino acids, okay, without any modification. We'll see a few in a second. Uh, some of the neurotransmitters are slightly modified amino acids, usually by means of removing the carboxy group and making an amine. Okay? And others are modified quite significantly, and we'll talk about those a little bit towards the end of the lecture. So all of them have at least something from an, an amino acid, and most of the time they are basically built completely out of amino acids. Neurotransmitters, as a rule, cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So any neurotransmitters, any already formed neurotransmitters that are in the blood, they cannot cross into the brain and similarly to the spinal cord, even though there, there it is a little bit more complicated. Um, the logic is quite clear, I think, because we don't want external neurotransmitters, which may be formed, for example, in the adrenal glands or somewhere else or in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. We don't want them mess up the signaling in the brain. So everything is set up in the body in such a way that either these neurotransmitters are destroyed before they can get to the brain, okay, and there are a lot of mechanisms for that, for example, in the gut, because the bacteria in the gut, they tend to make a lot of interesting chemicals, okay, because they have completely different metabolism from, from our metabolism, and they produce lots of potential hallucinogens and strange things, okay. Most of them are destroyed in the gut or in the liver, so they, they really can't get anywhere past the liver. But those that do, or that are produced somewhere else in our body, they are prevented from being transported into the brain across the blood-brain barrier. So all neurotransmitters, with the possible exception of glycine, I will mention it again when we talk about glycine, 
all the other neurotransmitters have to be synthesized de novo from, from scratch in the nerve cells. Okay? And we'll see how that works. But just be aware that even those neurotransmitters, which are basically just amino acids, they cannot be taken up from the blood. Either they have to be taken up as a precursor or they have to be synthesized from scratch. Okay? So that's quite different from all the other cells in the body. They can just you know, uh, grab an amino acid from the blood and use it, not the brain. All right? Um, the last general thing that I'll say before we get to the, uh, to the specifics is that once the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse, there has to be a way to stop the signal, so to remove the neurotransmitter. Okay? And there are two basic, two primary mechanisms how to do that. One is that there is an enzyme directly in the synapse which breaks down the neurotransmitter and stops, act, stops its activity. And this is the case, for example, for acetylcholine esterase, which we briefly saw previously, but we will talk about it today in more detail. So that is an enzyme which breaks down acetylcholine. Again, we'll see the details in a second. And that's actually present extracellularly, so it's actually excreted from the postsynaptic neuron, and it sits in the cytoplasmic, uh, 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 sorry, in the synaptic cleft, and just waits for the, for the neurotransmitter and, and breaks it down. The other possibility, and there are other ones as well, I'll mention them later. The other possibility, which is true for most neurotransmitters, is that the neurotransmitter is taken up to the presynaptic neuron. So there are transporters in the presynaptic neuron which take the neurotransmitter once it's been released into the synaptic left and pump them back into the presynaptic neuron where they can be either destroyed or recycled and reused and repackaged into the, the vesicles. A subset of this reuptake, so the name of this process is called reuptake. So a, a different type of reuptake is the uptake into the astrocyte, and that's something that we will see today in quite some detail. Okay? So some neurotransmitters are not taken up primarily by the presynaptic neuron, they are taken up by the astrocyte, and the astrocyte then recycles them and exports them back to the presynaptic neuron so that they can be used for neurotransmission again. Okay? So those are the main modes of what to do with the neurotransmitter. Good. Let's get to the specifics. So if we talk about neurotransmitter, if we talk about the brain, we talk just about the brain, 99.9% .9 of all neurons, okay, I'm just making up the number, it's probably even even bigger proportion than that, use only one of two neurotransmitters. Do you know which neurotransmitters I'm talking about? Hmm? Well, yes, so we can, we can classify all neurotransmitters into inhibitory and, and excitatory, but that's really more based on receptors, because when, once we talk about receptors, we will see that some neurotransmitters will have both inhibitory and excitatory receptors, and they can do both. Okay, so yeah, the, the action of neurotransmitter can be divided into these things, but the, big, the great majority of all neurons in the brain only use two specific neurotransmitters. One is glutamate, which is mostly excitatory, but not only. There are also inhibitory receptors for, for glutamate. And GABA, which stands for gamma amino butyric acid. We'll see that in more detail in a second. Which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter? So the vast majority of all neurons in the brain will be using either this or this. Now, today we will be talking about 10-ish neurotransmitters, okay, loads of them. For pharmacology, Many of the other neurotransmitters are much more important. There are many more drugs that interfere with all the other neurotransmitters. 
But just be aware that if we, once we talk about all the other neurotransmitters, they are forming something like a fraction of a percent of all the brain, okay? They are functionally extremely important, but just by numbers, they are minority neurotransmitters. Good. We will get to glutamate and GABA in a detail because those two are actually closely interlinked. So I will describe their, their metabolism together. But before we get to glutamate and GABA, let's talk about neurotransmit neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters, which are just unmodified amino acids because there are quite a few. So of course, one of them is glutamate, but we'll get to that, okay? The other very important neurotransmitter, which is just an amino acid without any modification, is aspartic acid, aspartate. Aspartate, so it's just unmodified amino acid. It's mostly excitatory, but you know we don't need to talk about the effects at the moment. But aspartic acid serves as a relatively minor, but still important neurotransmitter. Now, I said that in the brain, we can't rely on the blood to provide us with aspartate, as many other cells would do. We have to make aspartate from scratch. So what are the possible metabolic pathways to make aspartate? Sorry, you have to speak up a little bit so that I can hear you. Transamination. Transamination of what? Excellent. So transamination of oxaloacetate. Okay. So we can transaminate oxaloacetate by using some amino acid. Okay. Usually it's going to be glutamate. Okay. And okay, just pay attention. If we want to transaminate oxaloacetate with glutamate, one of the products is going to be aspartate and the other product is going to be Excellent. Two ketoglutarate, alpha oxaglutarate, whatever you want to call it. Excellent. Very well. So, transamination from ox oxaloacetate. How can we get oxaloacetate? We can get it from the Krebs cycle, absolutely. But remember, if we take something from the Krebs cycle, we have to put it back, otherwise the Krebs cycle stops, right? It's a cycle. So, if we start removing some of the intermediates, we have to add them back at some point, okay? So yes, we can get it from Krebs cycle, from the Krebs cycle, but then we have to, you know, input some other intermediates in. But is there another way to make oxaloacetate? Tell me more about gluconeogenesis or how it's related. So we can make oxaloacetate. Excellent. So we can make oxaloacetate from pyruvate, okay? And that's a better way. I mean, it, it can still go through the Krebs cycle, that's, that's fine. But pyruvate, we can get from glucose, and we're not making use of intermediates of the Krebs cycle, okay? So that's how we can make aspartic acid in the nerve cell, if it needs it, okay? And the only thing we need for that is a bit glutamate, but there is plenty of glutamate, as we'll see in a second, around. So that's just a quick synthesis of, of aspartate. Uh, the next uh, amino acid which serves as, as a neurotransmitter, and it's actually a neurotransmitter mostly found in the spinal cord. We don't really find it anywhere else. It's mostly in the spinal cord, is glycine. So glycine, a, an amino acid, you all know it, the simplest amino acid. Now, I said that glycine is an exception because the cells in the spinal cord can really take it up from the, from the blood, okay? So they don't really have to synthesize it from scratch. But, and a bit of a revision of amino acid metabolism, if we wanted to synthesize glycine from something else, how would we do it? Excellent. So one possibility is from serine. That's absolutely correct. And there is another very... I'm very impressed. Well done. So 
So this is a mitochondrial synthesis of glycine. This occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. And we can take carbon dioxide, ammonia, and methylene tetrahydrofolate and put it all together and make glycine. Now, why do I like this reaction so much and why am I so impressed is that this is a very unusual reaction in our metabolism because we're taking basically inorganic things, okay, just carbon dioxide and ammonia, okay, this is fairly organic and fairly complex, but we just take them together and we put them together and we make an amino acid. This is usually what bacteria do or what plants do, okay? It's not a usual thing to see in a metabolism that we just take inorganic things, combine them and make an amino acid. So it's one of my favorite reactions. It's not probably so important in our metabolism, but it's there and it's possible. Excellent. So yeah, so this is absolutely what, what we can do um, to make lysine. Okay. Now, so with these two amino acids, which was mostly a revision, let us have a look at the main ones, yep. Can you please repeat, it's carbon dioxide, ammonia and... Ammonia and methylene tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate. Yeah, so it's a folic acid derivative. We'll, we will talk about these one carbon uh, things in when we talk about the metabolism of nucleotides. So they will discuss it in more detail, but it's from folic acids, folic acid, the cofactor is called tetrahydrofolate. We talked about it months ago when we talked about cofactors, but yeah, so that's the one. Right, let us now have a look at the main two, glutamate and GABA, because they are chemically quite closely related. So, let us imagine that we have a synapse which is glutamateergic. Now, if you've not heard this term, when we use the neurotransmitter name, and we add ergic, we mean that it's a synapse that uses glutamate, okay? So there will be cholinergic, glutamateergic, serotonergic, okay? So this is a very common thing in neuroscience or in neuropharmacology. Just be aware that it exists, yep? The yeah, the this, both, okay? So anything that works, again, we have, I'm sure we have Greek speakers here, so anything that works with glutamate or through glutamate, so it could be a receptor, it could be a synapse, it could be neuron, glutamatergic neuron, which would be this neuron in this case. Yeah. Good. So we have a glutamatergic synapse, and in the presynaptic neuron, we have glutamate to package into the vesicle so that it can be released and bound to receptors. So this is something that we've seen in general before. Now, how do we make this glutamate? Okay, again, we can't just take it from the blood, okay, because the blood-brain barrier is set up in a different way. Actually, it might be a good time to show this, how this works. Uh, if these are endothelial cells in the blood-brain barrier, so here we have blood, okay, we have blood, and here we have the astrocytes and the, the nerve tissue, okay. Um, the way the, the transporters along the endothelium are set up is such that on the, on the side, which is on the opposite of the blood, so the abluminal side, we have transporters which tra transport glutamate with sodium. So what kind of transport is that, glutamate with sodium? Generally speaking, it is a symport and it's with sodium. It's a secondary active transport, yeah? Because we do have, with any cell, we have a big gradient, big concentration gradient of sodium. There's much more sodium outside than inside of the cell. So we use it to pull stuff into the, into the cell, okay? So it's a secondary active transport. So the transporters on the abluminal side are doing everything they can to take all the glutamate from the nerve tissue and pump it back into the blood, okay? The logic, again, is, I think is clear, because glutamate is a very important, one of the most important neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters in the brain, so you don't really want to have any glutamate just you know, floating around, around the cells, because it will be causing signals to go through the, the nerve cells. 
So any glutamate which is released from the, uh, from the nerve cells has to be taken up by something or exported into the blood. Okay, so that's, that's the logic. We don't want to have any spu spurious signals that would be you know, destroying the signaling. Okay? So everything is pumped from the brain out. Now, one of the reasons why I'm describing this is that you may have heard, I mean, it's not so big as it used to be before, uh, previously, but um, there used to be the scare of glutamate in like Asian food, you know, where, where in Chinese food, for example, they added monosodium glutamate and everybody's like, oh, it's neurotoxic and whatever. Now, glutamate is really neurotoxic if you inject it into the brain. Okay, so if you take glutamate, you inject it into the brain, it's going to wreak havoc there. Okay, it's really dangerous for the cells. It's going to destroy nerve cells. However, our system is so designed that any glutamate that it gets into the blood, which it will get from this food, whether it's soy sauce or synthetic monosodium glutamate or whatever, it will never cross into the brain because everything is set up in the opposite direction. Okay, so this idea that glutamate in the food is dangerous or it may destroy your brain, that's actually not true. It will not harm your brain in any way. Okay, um, anyway, so just, just an aside. Good, going back to glutamate. So we have to make glutamate in order to be able to package it into the vesicles. How can we make glutamate? Okay, one possibility is from glutamine. What, what kind of reaction? Okay, so we remove ammonia. That is true. And the reaction is called? It's not transamination. It's not even deamination. No, it's not so complicated because actually, huh? No, uh, the group that we're removing in glutamine is not the amino group. It's the other one. Indeed. So this is deamidation. Okay, it's not the amino group we're taking away. It's the amido group that we're taking away. Or, or you could have just said hydrolysis because it's a hydrolysis of an amine, okay? So it's a hydrolysis. But deamidation is fine, okay? So yeah, this is absolutely what we can do. And glutamine can be absolutely taken from the blood, okay? So glutamine can, glutamate cannot, but glutamine, because it has different transporters, so glutamine can be taken up from the blood and can be then used by the nerve cells to produce glutamate. Now, of course, this is not the only way to make glutamate. There are other possibilities. How can we make glutamate? From alpha ketoglutarate. And there are two ways to make glutamate from alpha, alpha ketoglutarate. As transamination, for which we need some other amino acid, but that's fine. So that's transamination. So oxidative deamination goes in the opposite direction. So in the right direction, would it be reductive amination? Reductive amination, absolutely. So we can make glutamate from 2-ketoglutarate through reductive amination, OK? Just, just taking the same reaction. What, what is the enzyme called? Excellent. So it's called glutamate dehydrogenase, a super important enzyme for the urea cycle and other things. Okay. So glutamate dehydrogenase can be reversed in the opposite direction, and we can make uh, we can make glutamate from ammonia to ketoglutarate and NADH, and reverse the reaction to make glutamate. Excellent. Very well. I mean, you clearly know your metabolisms. That's nice. Um, <laughs> all right, excellent. So these are the possibilities how we can make glutamate. The majority is going to come from glutamine, which, as you will see, makes perfect sense. So glutamate goes into the, uh, into the synaptic cleft. There it binds to receptors. It causes some, 
signaling cascades. We'll talk about those in a later lecture. But then we need to remove this glutamate from the synaptic cleft. Now, a little part of that will be removed directly into the presynaptic neuron, but the majority of it will go into the astrocyte. Okay? Remember, we have an astrocyte right next door. So the glutamate will be transported again by symport with sodium. So it's a second reactive transport. Okay? It's a really active, it's trying to push it in. Okay? And this glutamate will be taken up to the astrocyte. And in the astrocyte, this glutamate will be recycled back to glutamine, and this glutamine then returned to the neuron so that it can be used for making glutamate. Now, how do we, and I know you know it because you know so much of the metabolism, so how can we make glutamine from glutamate? Say again? Well, that's part of it. So we need ammonia and we need ATP. We need ATP and this will become very important. So this ammonia, where does it come from? Well, we can basically say it's this ammonia. So there's some amount of ammonia in the brain which is just being used for these reactions. Okay, so ammonia is not really a big problem. But this ATP obviously has to be made by the astrocyte in the Krebs cycle because the astrocyte is, is generally oxidative. Okay, so it is in the Krebs cycle it's making ATP and it is a process as you can see which requires for each cycle of this thing requires one ATP per molecule of glutamate. Now under normal conditions this is taken care for because the astrocyte obviously is making enough ATP. However, in situations where, they get, where the concentration of ammonia in the brain increases, this can become a massive problem. Now you may say, how does that happen? Well, this happens mostly in the case of liver failure. So liver is responsible for getting rid of all ammonia. How does it do it? in the urea cycle, right? The urea cycle is primarily or almost entirely in the liver. So all the ammonia and the majority of ammonia is produced in the gut by the bacteria, which are degrading all the protein from, from the food and everything. So most of the ammonia in the body is produced in the gut and the liver just filters all this ammonia away from the, from the blood which is coming from the gastrointestinal tract so that basically none of it gets into the systemic circulation and the brain is fine. If the liver starts failing because of poisoning or cirrhosis or whatever, cancer or whatever, um, the level of ammonia in the blood starts going up. Now, ammonia is a tiny, it's a very small uncharged molecule, so it very easily crosses the blood-brain barrier, okay? The blood-brain barrier is permeable to ammonia quite easily. So the concentration of ammonia starts increasing in the brain tissue as well. Now, one of the things that happens is that as the ammonia concentration increases, the rate of this reaction increases as well. And this means that the ATP levels in the astrocytes start to decrease because a lot of the ATP is being used to synthesize glutamine. And this can cause big problems for the bioenergetics of the astrocyte. Clinically speaking, this condition hyperammonia, hyperammonemia, sorry, hyper, hyperammonemia, so high concentration of ammonia in the blood. Uh, so clinically speaking, you will see the patients becoming confused. So there is a neurological deficit, but in the end, the brain starts to swell. Why does it start to swell? Well, because the cells themselves, as they are losing ATP, as they don't have enough ATP, they cease to be able to keep the iron balance across the membrane in the right ratio, and they start to suck in, osmotically, they start to suck in water. So the brain starts swelling, which is called brain edema, and that's a bit of a problem because the brain is in a relatively confined space, right? It doesn't really have a lot of places to go. Um, and what it does, it starts to push 
into the spinal canal because that's the only opening it has and that kills the patient very quickly, okay? Uh, because all the centers for, for respiration and everything are down there in the oblongata and they are pushed into the spinal canal by the pressure and it can kill the patient very quickly. Yeah, it's basically a herniation of the oblongata. Correct. Sweating happens in the astrocytes? It starts in the astrocytes. It will actually happen in the neurons as well, okay? Because of this reaction, okay? And because of the depletion of the Krebs cycle, because we are also taking two ketoglutrate from the Krebs cycle through this reaction, okay? I didn't want to complicate it too much, but yeah, this is another problem. And it will stop the metabolism of neurons as well, okay? The last thing, and this is really just about the clinic, um, since you are basically taking away ketoglutrate, you're making too much glutamate, you also mess up the signaling in the brain. And that's why it starts with confusion, with hallucinations, etc., and it can progress relatively quick, quickly to death. Um, and it needs to be treated, and there are ways to treat it, okay? So it's not, it's not uh, necessarily a fatal thing, but this, to, this is just to show the mechanism behind it, okay? The whole thing, the whole... I'm not going to say, the whole condition is called hepatic encephalopathy. Which is just a clinical term, okay? So encephalopathy, the function of the brain is wrong, caused by hepatic failure. There are other mechanisms that add to this problem, but this is the major one, this hyperammonemia. Okay, the usual treatment is to give antibiotics, interestingly, to kill off the bacteria in the gut so that they stop producing all this ammonia and this can decrease the, the amount of ammonia. Okay, it's not, a, it's not a cure, but it can help in this condition. You mentioned that the, when we have hyperammonemia, uh, ammonemia, hyperammonemia, uh, there's a lack of ATP. Yes. How does that occur? What was the reason why? So, it increases the rate of this reaction, which consumes ATP. In the neurons, it potentiates this reaction, which depletes 2-ketoglutrate that you need for the Krebs cycle to run around. Okay, so it, yeah, causes problems everywhere. Good, so this is the cycle of glutamate glutamine, which is a very important cycle in the, uh, in the brain. As you can see, it uses ATP just for the thing to be recycled. The other side of this picture, which occurs in different neurons, is the GABA cycle. So in other types of neurons, which are GABAergic, so this would be a GABAergic neuron. Now, maybe I'll just reiterate, maybe I said it before, most of the time, each neuron produces only one neurotransmitter, okay? So it is extremely rare, if it exists at all, that a, that a neuron will be producing more than one neurotransmitter, okay? So each neuron is specific, will be producing specifically just one neurotransmitter, okay? This might be an important thing to say, okay? There might be some exceptions, but mostly it works like this. One neuron, one neurotransmitter. So this would be a different, different completely different neuron, which is GABAergic. So it produces GABA which is packed into, into vesicles, etc. Now, GABA, we haven't really spoken about it yet, so I need to show you how to make it. Now, GABA is synthesized in one step from glutamate. So we can start with glutamate. Well, let's do it like this. We start with glutamate, and what we do to it is we decarboxylate it. And this is something that we'll see again and again and again and again in neurotransmitter synthesis, that there is almost always a step of decarboxylation, okay? So we decarboxylate it here, and what we get is gamma 
amino butyric acid. Hence the name GABA. Okay. Oh, sorry. Like this. This one. Gamma. Gamma amino butyric acid. Does it make sense? Good. The enzyme, as you would expect, is called glutamate decarboxylase. Glutamate decarboxylase. And you would expect it to have what coenzyme? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give me numbers. Yeah. Uh, pyridoxal phosphate, so B6. It's a derivative of B6. Huh? No, 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 no. Biotin is for carboxylation, not for decarboxylation. Biotin is for carboxylation. Okay, careful. Okay, so this will indeed contain PLP uh, as its as its cofactor, pyridoxal phosphate. So we decarboxylate glutamate to give us GABA. GABA is released into the synaptic cleft. There are some GABA receptors. We'll talk about the subtypes and, wh and what they do later on. So they will start some, uh, some signaling cascades. Now, what happens to GABA? Again, the majority of GABA is taken up by the astrocyte. Okay? It doesn't have to be the same one. Okay? It, it looks like it's the same astrocyte, but obviously it needn't, needn't be the same one. And GABA is imported once again with sodium into the astrocyte, which stopped the signal. So that's easy. But now what the astrocyte has to do is to do something with the GABA, to either degrade it or, which is indeed the case, to recycle it back to glutamate or rather more specifically to glutamine because it can do glutamine from glutamate. We already know that. So the goal now is to figure out how to take this molecule and how to turn it back to glutamate and then to glutamine. So the last step is easy. Glutamate to glutamine we know already. But how can we turn this back to glutamate? Indeed, carboxylation would be the easy thing, okay? Obviously, that's not the case, <laughs> okay? That would be too easy. But yeah, of course, you could just, in theory, you could carboxylate and it would be back where you were, okay? But that's not what happens, like, for whatever reason, okay? So there is a little bit more complicated way to get back to glutamate. So transamination is a very good suggestion. What do we get if we transaminate GABA. So if I just draw it, if I just draw the structure, well, what, what, what's going what's gonna, to what's gonna end up being here? It's a transamination. Okay, so we remove the amino group, and instead of the amino group, we get it's going to be an aldehyde, right? It's not going to be a ketone. Usually it's a ketone because it's the, it's the alpha carbon, but here it's, it's different. So it's going to be an aldehyde, right? So we're going to get a compound which looks like this. Which looks like this. Okay? And this is called succinate semi-aldehyde. Okay, it's a non-systematic name, but it tells you a little bit what happens next. Okay, so it's, it's a weird name, it's called semi-aldehyde. Why is it a semi-aldehyde? Any guesses? Huh? It's like half aldehyde, because the other carboxy group is still a carboxy group. So if this was an aldehyde as well, then it would be a succinyl aldehyde or something. It doesn't exist, okay? I mean, it, it exists, but that's not what it's called but it's a succinate, succinate semi-aldehyde, or succinyl semi-aldehyde. Good. So this is what we get by transaminating this. And the enzyme is called GABA transaminase. 
GABA T, GABA transaminase. GABA transaminase, as any good transaminase would, contains what as a cofactor? Just call it pyridoxal phosphate, because pyridoxal phosphate is the cofactor, B6 is the vitamin. Okay? The vitamin itself does not have any cofactor activity. We first have to turn it to pyridoxal phosphate, and that's what works. Okay? So it is a derivative of B6, but it's not B6. It's pyridoxal phosphate. So yes, it contains pyridoxal phosphate. And another interesting thing about gamma transaminase is that it's a mitochondrial enzyme. It's an enzyme that's in the matrix of the mitochondria. So this GABA first has to be imported into the mitochondrion. And there is a transporter for it. It's actually a transporter for glutamate, but it apparently it transports uh, GABA as well. And until very recently, it was unknown what this transporter is. But now there is a candidate transporter for that. So GABA is transported into the matrix of the mitochondrion. There, GABA transaminase makes it into succinate semialdehyde. And what happens next? What, what, what could happen next? What would, be a logical thing, what would be the logical thing to do? Yeah, we would oxidize it to give us succinate. Absolutely. So we oxidize it using an AD plus to give us succinate. The enzyme that catalyzes this, in the previous lectures, I would always say, oh, it's just some aldehyde dehydrogenase. But no, it's actually a specific enzyme called succinate semi-aldehyde dehydrogenase. <laughs> okay, so we have a special enzyme just for this, succinate semi-aldehyde dehydrogenase. Well, and once we have succinate and we are in the matrix of the mitochondrion, what do we do next? We need to get to glutamate. The eventual goal, the final goal is glutamate. Yeah, but we need to do some steps between that. So, so we, have, we have succinate, yeah? Yes, in the Krebs cycle, succinate gets turned to? No. That was before, but yeah, we have succinate already. So from succinate, we make fumarate then malate, then oxaloacetate, then we have to add another acetyl-CoA to make citrate, and then we go all the way to 2-ketoglutrate, to oxoglutrate, whatever you want to call it, alpha-ketoglutrate, okay? Which we then transaminate or aminate to make glutamate. And then to glutamine, Okay, I'm not going to go step by step because we, I think we covered it mostly before. Yeah, just let me know if this makes sense. Okay, so the tricky bits are, well, decarboxylation, then transamination of GABA, and then oxidation of the succinate semialdehyde. And the rest of it is, has been covered before. Okay, so hopefully it makes sense. Yep. Is this process more efficient to say so than a simple carboxylation? Who knows? Like that I, I don't know. It's, there might be a reason for it or maybe just a random thing that that's how it evolved. Because yeah, I mean, the carboxylation I think should be biochemically possible. We would probably use 2 ATP for that, but we still, we use more than that in this. So I, I don't know. That's how it evolved. Not for these one, not for either of these ones. Okay. But here we actually have to add another acetyl-CoA. Okay. So, so we are actually, yeah. So, so here we are in effect using more than that. I, I don't know what the reason is. All right. Any questions about glutamate and GABA? Yes. Yeah, so all these reactions happen in the astrocyte, all the way to glutamine, and then glutamine is exported and, and used by the neuron. OK, let's take a three minute break and we'll continue with some other neurotransmitters. All right, let us continue with the next group of neurotransmitters. So now we're not going to talk just about one, but actually a whole group 
which are all synthesized in the same pathway. Okay, so it's one pathway that gives us three members of this group, and this group is called catecholamines. Catecholamines. So what, what are the members of catecholamines? You've heard about them before. Okay, so dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline. Okay, these are the correct names. So if you read some literature from the US which uses epinephrine, norepinephrine, those are not the recommended names to be used anywhere in the world. They still use them, but the, the correct names are dopamine, adrenaline, dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. So those three catecholamines are synthesized in the same pathway from the same starting substance, which is tyrosine. Which is tyrosine. Now, tyrosine itself is an essential amino acid, or it's considered as one, but in fact, we can make tyrosine from phenylalanine. What reaction is this? What do we have to do to phenylalanine to make tyrosine? Hydroxylation. It's hydroxylation. The enzyme is called phenyl phenylalanine hydroxylase, and we talked about in the very first lecture of this subject because it's damaged in a disease called phenylketonuria. Yeah? Okay, so this is what, we, what we've seen before, is the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine, which causes all these problems. And you may recall, some of you might, that this phenylalanine hydroxylase has an has a unusual cofactor. It's not tetrahydrofolate, but it does start with tetra tetrahydro. <laughs> It's called tetrahydrobiopterin. Tetrahydrobiopterin. Now, this is a cofactor that we see mostly in these kind of hydroxylases, and we'll see it in, we see it even today in quite a few, especially when we're hydroxylating this aromatic ring, which is not an easy thing to do. So there we have tetrahydrobiopterin. And I will just mention that tetrahydrobiopterin is not a derivative of any vitamin. It's something that we actually synthesize in our cells, okay? So this is completely our own stuff, okay? Which is, again, a little bit unusual for cofactors. Most of the cofactors have to come from the diet. Not so tetrahydrobiopterin. We make it our own. All right, so we have tyrosine. And the first step in the synthesis of catecholamines is actually a second hydroxylation on the ring. And this is what gives the whole group its name, because this structure is called pyrocatechol, hence the name catecholamines, because they contain this pyrocatechol thing. Okay, so I'll just draw it a little bit nicer. So the first thing that we do is we add another hydroxy group here, and the rest of the stuff stays the same. Sorry, uh, I put NH3. It should be consistent with these things, so let's be consistent. So we just make a tyrosine which was modified with one hydroxy group. It's still an amino acid, it's not a neurotransmitter. And this thing is called dihydroxyphenylalanine. Dihydroxyphenylalanine, as you would expect. Usually, you will find it under the abbreviation DOPA, which basically is di oxyphenylalanine, but we know it's not dioxy, it's dihydroxy, right? So the abbreviation is a bit funny, okay? But this is what we would see, or you would see it as L-dopa because we, only, we are only interested in the correct configuration on this carbon, on this asymmetric carbon, yeah? That's why the name L-dopa. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay, good. 
So this is L-DOPA, still not a neurotransmitter, it's an amino acid. And this is also the reason why we can give L-DOPA as a medication to patients who need to you know, raise the synthesis of catecholamines, we can talk about it later on, because L-DOPA as an amino acid can cross the blood brain barrier, it will be imported in, into the brain, but the products of, the, of this pathway would not be. So we can't give directly dopamine or something like that. I mean, we can give it, but it's not gonna get into the brain, okay? It will have effects elsewhere in the body, but not in the brain. L-DOPA will get into the brain and can be used in this pathway. In the, in the oh, sorry, uh, <coughs> the, the enzyme is called tyrosine hydroxylase. Okay, not surprising, I guess. And tyrosine hydroxylase, because it is catalyzing a very similar kind of reaction as the one before, it also contains tetrahydrobiopterin as a cofactor. Okay? Yeah. In the next step, what we do with L-DOPA, we decarboxylate it. Okay? Again, a very common thing in the synthesis of neurotransmitters. We start with, them, with an amino acid, and at some point, we decarboxylate it. Okay, so here is the decarboxylation step. And this decarboxylation makes an amine from the amino acid. So this was an amino acid and we make an amine. Hence the name catecholamines because they contain this pyrocatechol thing and they're amines, right? So this is our amine, and it's called it's called dopamine. It's called dopamine. It is called dopamine. The enzyme is called dopa decarboxylase, or we can call it dopa decarboxylase, and it contains as a cofactor PLP. PLP, indeed. Yeah, it's a decarboxylation of an amino acid. Usually, or almost always, there is a pyridoxal phosphate there. So, dopa decarboxylase. More generally, this enzyme is called the decarboxylase of L-aromatic amino acids. Now, that's a weird name. <laughs> yes, indeed. L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Uh, I think sometimes you can just see it with, with two A's and not with, not with three, but L-aromatic amino acid uh, decarboxylase is the general name of this enzyme. Now, why do I tell you this, and why am I not content with just dopa decarboxylase? Because that would be easy, right? Because we will see this enzyme in a different pathway in a second. And it's the same enzyme, it catalyzes basically the same reaction, which is a different substrate. So that's why it's good to know that it's gonna be the same enzyme, okay? So we have dopamine, and dopamine is a real neurotransmitter. Outside of the brain, it also works as a hormone, and we'll see some of the effects and what, what it does elsewhere in the body in the, like on Tuesday or something in a lecture when we talk about some of the effects of these things and how we use medications to um, influence them. Um, so we'll see that it also works outside of the brain, but in the brain, it is one of the minor neurotransmitters, okay? It's important, it has important functions. If it doesn't work, we get diseases, uh, but it's a, it's a relatively minor um, neurotransmitter. Right, what happens next? Well, functionally it's extremely important. It's minor in numbers. So the number of neurons that use dopamine in the brain is tiny. It's a very small proportion of neurons that use dopamine, that are dopaminergic, okay? But functionally, it's absolutely crucial, okay? We, we couldn't live without it, okay? So, 
in dopaminergic neurons, in neurons that produce dopamine, here is where we end. It's not going to progress any further. Okay? But in neurons that produce something else, we can go one or two steps further. And the next possible step is that we add another hydroxy group. But this time, the hydroxy group is not going to go on the aromatic ring. It's actually going to go on the side chain. So what we, we basically add a hydroxy group here. Okay. So Now this molecule is called noradrenaline. called noradrenaline and is another neurotransmitter or hormone okay so noradrenergic neurons would stop here what is the enzyme called it's called dopamine beta hydroxylase because it is hydroxylating the alpha beta carbon alpha beta yeah dopamine beta hydroxylase and it is an enzyme that requires, as a cofactor, requires copper or iron. That's kind of the boring bit, but it's worth knowing. But the interesting bit is that it also, contain, it also requires ascorbic acid. It requires vitamin C for its function. And as you will see, or we will see together in uh, another lecture, there are actually very few reactions in our body that require ascorbic acid as a cofactor. Okay, so vitamin C is all this. Uh, we need vitamin C for immunity and whatever. Whatever. In metabolism, there are only two or three reactions that require vitamin C. Very very few reactions. This is one of them. Okay, so we need vitamin C for this production of noradrenaline, uh, but otherwise there are actually not that many. It does have other functions, but metabolically speaking, it, it, it's not a very abundant or it's not a very, how to say it, widely used cofactor. Let's put it that way. So do, do, dopamine beta hydroxylase is this enzyme. Yeah. In the book, they call it the dopamine beta oxidase. It's definitely beta hydroxylase, that's the name. I mean, Functionally, or the mechanistically, it may be a monooxygenase, so it could be a monooxygenase, uh, but it's definitely not oxidase. Mm, nope. <laughs> it's a hydroxylase, okay? Yeah. Good. So we're almost there. We're almost at the, at the very end. Because the last thing that we do because the last thing that we do is we take noradrenaline and we make it into adrenaline by adding a methyl group here. What is what? Sorry? Oh, well, that's actually this methyl group. So if generally in chemistry, in organic chemistry, if you remove one carbon, the product of that is called nor. Okay, so we have adrenaline. If we remove one carbon group, it's called noradrenaline. Usually it's a methyl group, but sometimes it can be a CH2 group. CH2 group but usually it's a methyl group. So if you remove, remove a methyl group from something, you call it nor something, okay? So it goes kind of against the, uh, the synthesis, but that's, that's where the name comes from. So yeah, we add a methyl group and we're gonna use the usual donor of the methyl group, which is, there are a few, yeah. Hmm? 
I love it that you first mentioned tetrahydrofolate because usually it's the other way around, but here it's not tetrahydrofolate, <laughs> but, but great because that's my favorite donor of, of methyl group. But this is the other one. Yeah. It's s anosomethionine correct. Okay, it's s anosomethionine Okay, so that's the donor of, of a methyl group. It's a very common one, but methyl tetrahydrofolate is absolutely a common one as well. Okay, just in this reaction, it's not the one. Okay, so s methionine is the donor of, uh, of the methyl group. <coughs> and this is it. So we have now synthesized all three catecholamines, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline. Again, for neurons that only produce dopamine, we're gonna stop here. For neurons that produce noradrenaline, we're gonna stop here. And those that would produce uh, adrenaline, we would stop there. Well, or we would go the whole way, I guess. Okay, so that's how it is, uh, how the specificity of the, of the neuron is achieved. Now, how do we degrade these catecholamines? So, first thing to say is that all catecholamines, once they are released into the synaptic cleft, they are removed from the synapse by reuptake. So they are taken up back into the presynaptic neuron. They're not taken up into the astrocyte, or at least not the majority of it. Most of it is taken back into the presynaptic neuron. Now, in the presynaptic neuron, okay, so there's a reuptake. In the presynaptic neuron, there are several possible, <laughs> there are several possible things to, to happen. Usually, most of the catecholamine is repackaged into a vesicle and is reused for neurotransmission. That makes sense. You know, why waste energy to make new, uh, uh, new catecholamine? So it is repackaged. The other possibility is that it is destroyed, that it is degraded. And the main enzyme, there are two enzymes, but one of them which takes care of the degradation of catecholamines is called monoamine oxidase. The abbreviation is MAO, monoamine oxidase. It is a mitochondrial enzyme. Uh, it's not a matrix enzyme, it's actually associated, it's in the intermembrane space somewhere. So it's a monoamine oxidase. There are several subtypes, but that's not very, that's not important. And what monoamine oxidase does, as the name suggests, it takes the amino group here, here, and even here, and it oxidizes it to an aldehyde. So it removes the amino group and makes an aldehyde out of the carbon next to it. Make sense what a monoamine oxidase does? Yeah, so it removes the amino group and makes an aldehyde instead. Now these aldehydes, as they are produced from, uh, from these catecholamines, are then oxidized to carboxylic acids. Okay, there are some aldehyde dehydrogenases which oxidize them to carboxylic acids. So that's one branch of degrading catecholamines. It's throughout monoamine oxidase, making aldehyde, and then making it into carboxylic acid. The other branch of degrading uh, catecholamines is through another enzyme called catechol O methyl transferase, or COMT. Catechol O methyl transferase, which basically just says that it's an enzyme that takes a methyl group and puts it on one of the two hydroxyls, this one actually. Okay, so it methylates this hydroxyl. It makes a methoxy group. Like so, like so, oh sorry, yeah. like so. Okay, so it's a methyl transferase, O methyl transferase, because it puts it onto an oxygen. 
Okay? There could be the N-methyl transferase, which puts it on nitrogen. It's old methyl because it puts it onto oxygen. So COMT is another possibility how to degrade catecholamines and stop them from acting, which makes these methoxy uh, derivatives. And the fun thing is that the two enzymes can work together. So, for example, the degradation can start with COMT and then continue with MAO, or it can start with MAO and then continue with COMT. That gives us a lot of different combinations of products that can be produced, okay? But if both of the enzymes act on these three catecholamines, we end up with two possible final products. The product of degradation of dopamine is called homovanillic acid. homovanillic acid. Now, we talked about NOR as a, as a prefix, which stands for missing one methyl group. This homo means one more carbon. Okay, so vanillic acid, I can actually draw what, what homovanillic acid looks like. It looks like this. This is homovanillic acid. Okay. If we removed this carbon, it would be vanillic acid. So it's called homovanillic acid because there's one more carbon. And if you think that it has something to do with vanilla, it does because the vanilla aldehyde, the thing that smells vanilla-like, okay, is a derivative of vanillic acid. If, if we reduce vanillic acid, we will get the vanilla aldehyde. Okay? So it, those two things are related uh, chemically or nomenclature-wise, they are related. They're not related metabolically. Or maybe they are, I don't know. I don't know how the, how the vanilla orchid actually makes this vanilla aldehyde. So that's homovanillic acid, or HVA, which is the final product of dopamine degradation. Now, adrenaline and noradrenaline have the same final product of degradation. Is this clear why that is? Because if we remove this amino group, it doesn't matter that there is some methyl group on it. It just gets you know, chopped away. So these two molecules will end up being the same product. And the name of this product, again, is a bit funny, is called vanyl mandelic acid. Vanyl mandelic acid. or VMA, vanillyl mandelic acid. Okay, it has something to do with almonds and vanilla at the same time. Vanillyl mandelic acid, bizarre. But that's what it's called, okay? And it would be the product of basically, oh, you know, if this was made into carboxy group, it would be vanillyl mandelic acid. The reason why I'm telling you these, the, name of these, the names of these products was, is that until quite recently, these were measured in the urine as, an, as a measure of a total output of catecholamines of a, of, in a human body. And it, they could be used, the, the values of these vanillyl mandelic acid or homovanillic acid could be used to diagnose problems with overproduction of catecholamines. Mostly it was tumors of the adrenal medulla, which produce a lot of catecholamines, and we could measure them using these, uh, the, the output of these degradation products. Nowadays, we have very sensitive methods for measuring directly the neurotransmitters, the catecholamines in the blood, which is a bit more precise. Okay? It's, it has its problems as well, okay? but for some purposes, it's better to measure directly those molecules. But it's good to know about those because for some purposes, it's still useful to measure vanilla mandelic acid and homovanillic acid. So that's why I'm telling you the names. Yep. Yeah, they are directly excreted. They're not modified in any way. They are directly excreted. Yeah. No, both of these enzymes work in the presynaptic neuron. However, there is a subtype of COMT, which is also extracellular. So some of the COMT 
is actually around the uh, presynaptic neuron. So it's not inside, but it's, it's around. So Mao and Comte are both inside, but there's a subtype of Comte, which is also on the outside. Which would be in specific neurons or in specific? Uh, I don't know. Okay. okay, but there are two subtypes of Comte, and one is inside and the other one is outside. Good. The hard part is over because we will use this and just adapt it for another basically two neurotransmitters and then I'll give you some other ones which will be a little bit easier, I think. Um, so these were catecholamines. The next neurotransmitter I want to talk about, but we'll see that the synthesis is actually very, very similar, even though it's a little bit shorter, is serotonin. Serotonin. Now, serotonin is synthesized not from tyrosine. It's synthesized from tryptophan. It shouldn't be drawn with a circle here, but I'm lazy, so I'm going to draw it like that. So yeah, let me just, okay, that's, that's still catecholamines, but now we're talking about serotonin and tryptophan. It's going to be here, it's going to be here, and it's going to be hydrogen here, but let's not worry about details. The first step in the synthesis of serotonin from tryptophan is the same as the first step in the synthesis of catecholamines which is a hydroxylation on the ring. So what we do, we actually add a hydroxyl group on the five carbon of the ring. Just gonna draw it very quickly. Okay, you all know what we're talking about. So there's gonna be a, a hydroxy group on the five carbon. So what we get, okay, they're not double bonds, don't worry about it, okay? Um, what we get is 5,5-hydroxy-tryptophan. Five, five so we start with tryptophan, and in the first step in the hydroxylation, we get 5-hydroxy-tryptophan. Again, this is not a neurotransmitter, it's still an amino acid. It doesn't have any activity on the receptors. But in the next step, we do the usual thing with neurotransmitters, which is decarboxylation. So we get rid of this carboxy group here. And we make an amine called serotonin. Now, more systematically speaking, serotonin is called 5-hydroxy-tryptamine. It's not tryptophan, because it's not an amino acid anymore. It's tryptamine. 5-hydroxy-tryptamine. And we usually abbreviate it as 5-HT, 5-hydroxy-tryptamine, which is the same thing as serotonin, but you will see this abbreviation 5-HT quite often. For example, serotonin receptors are all denoted as 5-HT receptors. They are never, never S receptors or anything like that. So serotonin and 5-HT is the same thing, okay? 5-hydroxytryptamine and serotonin is the same thing, just different names, okay? And we will be using this abbreviation a lot. That's it, that's the synthesis of serotonin, okay? So we're using the same things as we had for catecholamines, only it's a little bit shorter. This decarboxylase, remember I told you it's gonna come handy, is the L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. This is the same decarboxylase as we had for the synthesis of dopamine. Okay, I can see that you are slowly giving up uh, and getting tired. Nine minutes to go. Okay, so try to push a little bit of energy into that. So this is the same enzyme called 
L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, it contains pyridoxal phosphate, same thing. Yeah, it is, because it's an L-amino acid. It's still an L-amino acid. Yeah, I mean, maybe in some text, because it doesn't have the L, okay, it's, it's still the same thing. But it's specific for L-amino acid, so if you give it a D-amino acid, it's not going to work. Okay. How is, how is serotonin degraded? Again, we're going to reuse the stuff from catecholamines. So monoamine oxidase, monoamine oxidase, will also work on 5-hydroxytryptamine, on serotonin, because it's also a primary amine, okay? It still contains, I didn't draw the whole structure, but once we decarboxylate it, there is an amino, a primary amino group at the end, right? So monoamine oxidase perfect, is perfectly fine because it's a monoamine oxidase. There is a monoamine, it will oxidize it, okay? So there will be an aldehyde formed by the action of monoamine oxidase. And in the end, there is going to be a carboxylic acid. The name of the carboxylic acid of the final product of serotonin is 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid. 5-hydroxy, indole, acetic acid. Okay, it's not as mysterious, yeah? This is just the degradation of serotonin. That's the final product of degradation of serotonin, which is only by monoamine oxidase. Catechol or methyl transferase, the other enzyme which degrades catecholamines, cannot work here because this is not a catechol. It's not a catechol ring, so it's not, a, it's not going to work on it, okay? So catechol or methyl transferase is not, is not important here. And it's also secreted Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Interestingly, it's a plant hormone. It causes plant cells to increase in size, this 5 hydroxyindole acetic acid, an interesting fact. Um, all right, last few things. The neurotransmitter that we had talked about quite a lot, but we haven't mentioned yet today very much, is acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine, as you all know, is synthesized from, sorry, let's put the plus here is synthesized from acetyl-CoA, that's the easy bit, and then from choline. Choline itself is synthesized from serine. So remember, all neurotransmitters are really synthesized from amino acids. So what we do here is we have serine, We do the usual thing with, with neurotransmitters, which is decarboxylation. We get this thing, which is called ethanol amine. Ethanol amine. Yeah. And then we just add three times CH3, three methyl groups to this nitrogen, and we get choline. All these methyl groups come from s methionine, but one by one, and there are different enzymes for each step. I'm not going to tell you the names because they are horrible, okay, and you don't need to know them. Uh, but there's a separate enzyme for each step with a completely different name. But in the end, we get choline. And this choline then gets joined with acetyl-CoA to make acetyl-choline. And they are binding like tertiary amine or like it's a, like the, they are all bind to the amine? To the nitrogen, correct, yeah. So first you're gonna get NHCH3 and then NHCH32 and yeah. 
Good. The degradation of acetylcholine, as we said before, is through acetylcholine esterase, which basically just hydrolyzes this ester bond. And both the acetate and the choline are taken up to the presynaptic neuron. And most of the choline is recycled afterwards. So it's used again for the, for the neurotransmission. Okay? It can be also degraded by some oxidation steps, but that's not really that important to know at this point. So that's acetylcholine, super quickly. Okay? It comes from serine, and there are three steps of methylation. That's basically it. The last thing I'll talk about are peptides, peptide neurotransmitters. So there are neurotransmitters which are composed from more than one amino acid. There are peptides, right? It's, it's, a, it's a chain of amino acids. There are quite a few of them. Um, I'm not going to mention all of them today. I'll just mention, well, a couple. Um, the important thing about peptides is that they are mostly, if not entirely, there is now some debate about that, they have to be synthesized in the nucleus. Okay, so as all proteins have to be synthesized in the nucleus, that means that for, for some nerve cells, these peptides then have to travel all the way to the synaptic cleft to be used uh, in the neurotransmission. So unlike all the other neurotransmitters that we talked about, which are synthesized directly in the synapse, okay, they don't have to do anything else, the peptides generally have to be made in the, in the nucleus, in the cell body, and has to have to travel through the axon. Okay? Again, there is some debate at the moment. There might be some translation, maybe in the synapse, in the synaptic, well, we don't know. Okay? But the received knowledge is so far that it's, it's all in the, in the cell body. Now, some of these peptides are formed, as they are translated into a peptide, they are formed as large peptides, which are then cut up into smaller peptides, which then serve as neurotransmitters. And one such big peptide, precursor peptide, is called pro-opio-melanocortin, or POMC. Pro-opio-melanocortin. Why this strange name? Because this protein, this peptide, once it's, once it's made, it's cut up. It, there are actually several different ways how it can be cut up. And one possible way is that it is cut up into beta endorphin. Which is an endogenous opioid. And we'll talk about opioid receptors and all those things later on. Okay? So that's the opio because it's an opioid. Another part gets made into alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, alpha MSH, which is a weird hormone which in some animals really directs the activity of melanocytes in the skin and can change the color of their skin. In humans, this is almost definitely not what this hormone is doing. It's probably doing some other things with like appetite and all, all sorts of other things. But originally in evolution, this is what it was doing, and hence the name, melanocyte stimulating hormone. It still has some little bit of melanocyte stimulating activity, but that's probably not what it's doing. So it's there, but hence the name. And CORTIN stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH which then regulates the activity of the adrenal cortex and the production of corticoids there, okay? So this one big peptide gets translated and then it gets cut up into these individual peptides. This is just one way of cutting up propio melanocortin. There are some other ways as well, okay? But I'm showing you this because it explains the name, why this strange name, pro opio melanocortin. With some of the other neuropeptides, things work a little bit differently, but this is just to give you an idea how peptides are different from all the other ones. Now, the things I left out. One is nitric oxide. But you've seen that before. You know how nitric oxide is synthesized. It's synthesized from arginine, again, 
an amino acid, even though very little is left of the amino acid there, but it's synthesized from an amino acid. There, is nitro there are nitric oxide synthases, several different ones, and they, so you know that, okay? So I'm leaving that out. It is an important neurotransmitter, especially in some parts of the brain, so just be aware that it also belongs to, uh, to this chapter. The other thing I left out was histamine. Histamine is, it works everywhere in the body, but it's also in the brain and it serves some important functions there. Now, histamine is synthesized sup in a super simple way from histidine by decarboxylating it. Just take histidine, we make histamine. Okay, there's a special enzyme called histidine decarboxylase, which is decarboxylated, contains paradoxal phosphate as you would expect. Questions? Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's so a protein. It's in the body of the protein. Ab absolutely, yeah. Yes. Yep. The GLP also is being uh, made from the pure protein. The what? The glucagon like protein is also No, it's from, it, no, no, no. Okay. That's actually from, I think, alone. There is no larger protein as far as I know. Okay. Yep. There are loads of, neuro loads of different neuropeptides, yeah. Any other acute questions now? If not, thanks, that's it. Thank you.